excited. Um, thank you for being here on Saturday morning at uh, 8.15, 8.20. Um, hope everybody enjoyed uh, last evening. Um, I'm uh, pleased to sort of chair this panel today on assessment. Um, and I'm going to just do a couple of things to kick us off. First, um, the, the panelists today are an extremely <clears throat> distinguished group, um, all of whom have incredible expertise with respect to the topic of assessment. And so their bios are in the book. I'm just going to introduce them briefly. Uh, and um, we'll start with Ed Gordon, who's Professor Emeritus from Teachers College in Yale. Um, and Bob Sternberg from Cornell University, where he's professor of psychology and human development, I believe, there. Um, Lori Shepard, who is uh, professor and dean at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And Ed Hartle, who's uh, pr professor emeritus from Stanford University. Uh, and I'm Jim Pellegrino. Um, so, um, before we launch into the panelists' remarks and Bob's uh, remarks as respondent, I just wanted to set a little context <coughs> for the panel, especially for some of our younger folks who may not sort of know the history of the involvement of academy members and the academy itself in issues of assessment. I mean, I think it goes without saying that on a weekly basis, if not even more frequent than that, issues related to assessment, testing, fairness, policy practice of testing uh, are in the press almost uh, every week, um, sometimes more than that. Last week we heard about the release of the NAEP results. Um, we constantly hear about uh, the, you know, the release of results for Smarter Balanced and PARC. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's important to realize that members of the academy and the academy itself has had a, uh, a long history of involvement in issues of assessment in America, providing advice and trying to provide guidance with respect to that. Um, many members of this panel and uh, other members of the <clears throat> Academy have served on the Board on Testing and Assessment of the National Research Council. In fact, uh, that uh, board was established by Mike Foyer when he came to the NRC and the first chair of that board was Dick Atkinson. Um, uh, the uh, members of the academy and the, uh, have been involved in various reports related to assessment um, and trying to provide advice to um, the federal government uh, on what, make, what is sensible policy and practice. Um, I think one of the most, one of the, the examples of that is a, a report that uh, was led, or a, a committee and a report that was led by Bob Lynn and Bob Glazer and George Bornstedt. Uh, in, the, in the early 90s when NAEP was transitioning from just the national assessment to the so-called trial state assessment and the um, provisional achievement levels. Um, we could have a long discussion just about that, but the important thing was that the National Academy of Education um, was responsible for uh, a major committee and major sort of analysis of uh, and recommendations about NAEP and produced a, I think, an important report um, which was called Assessment in Transition. So there's been a long involvement of the Academy in <coughs> issues uh, related to assessment. We thought that it would be good to sort of have a panel discussion to get the take from um, each of our panelists in terms of their views on the issues of assessment and testing um, and what are some of the ways we might think more productively about this? Uh, what are some of the issues? So we're going to, we're, each panelist is going to have 15 minutes. We're going to start with Ed Gordon, and then um, <clears throat> we'll go to Ed Hartle, and then Lori Shepard, and then our respondent, Bob Sternberg. So Ed Gordon, I will turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Jim. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I forgot. Jane Hannaway was uh, was to be part of the panel today as well, but she had a <clears throat> family emergency arise yesterday, so she could not join us. Uh, thank you, Jim, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, before I get started, I simply want to welcome the Secretary of Education, who's an old friend and colleague to all of us. He's sitting in the front row here. Welcome, John. Nice to see you. 
I'm going to stay rather close to my manuscript. As you know, I'm getting a little old, and when I try to talk extemporaneously, I talk too long and forget what I wanted to say. But one of the things among many that I heard repeatedly during the three years that I was privileged to serve as chairperson of the Gordon Commission on the Future of Assessment is that assessment and measurement are about the generation of data that can be used to make inferences. Data to make inferences, from which, of course, we guide subsequent behavior. Now consider for a moment, to produce the data with which to generate good inferences, necessary to inform human judgment concerning these inferences with respect to the guidance of human development, we call it education, it requires at least three kinds of assessment. Measurement science has privileged the collection of data concerning one of these. We focused on the measurement of status, primarily the status of developed ability. This almost exclusive focus on the measurement of status, however, may be the, at the core of our problem. Incidentally, the Gordon Commission didn't really come to um, agreement on conclusions that all of us uh, could endorse, but uh, nobody refused to be identified with the observations that uh, Jim and I put in, put in the report. But I think we were reasonably close to two ideas. One, that we should not give up on the measurement of uh, status, of developed ability, but that we could do a lot more. Some of us felt that we should be. In that measurement of status, we asked the question, what is the status of previously developed abilities? For which data we depended primarily on quantitative analysis of samples of what learners know concerning a relatively narrow range of capabilities. We recognize that there's just lots of stuff we don't look at and don't measure. Most of it we have not learned how to measure and have thought that it contaminated the measurement of the stuff that we do know how to measure. We've not given a lot of attention to the analysis of processes and their context. To do so, we want to know what is the functional nature of a quality of extant and developing abilities. What is the functional nature of the quality of extant and developing abilities? For the determination of which, we must make better use of clinical and qualitative analysis of processes engaged in by teaching and learning persons. But as important as these processes and their contexts are, in order to generate inferences and in order to make judgments about those inferences, we need to add a third kind of information, which can be derived from relational and humanutical analyses. What are the relationships among and the meanings of the components of these pedagogical processes for which to collect, we will need to depend upon interpretive relational analytics and something the uh, social theorists are calling reflexivity. If there's a minute, I'll say a little, a little bit more about that. Interpretation of projective probes deconstruction of the demands of these probes, relational analysis in the search for correlates of human performance. Now, if we are to honor the call of the Gordon Commission that assessments should inform and improve teaching and learning processes and their outcomes, 
we may have no option but to enlarge the assessment box to make greater space for relational, for clinical, for qualitative, for these hermeneutical analyses. Measurement science may have to be greatly expanded, plus a good measure of reflexivity, transformative reflection on, examination of the information and experience to learn from it, learning how to think. It may be that we have depended so heavily on the quantitative data for signals that we have ne neglected our greatest capacity and that's the capacity to think about things. We do, or at least are beginning to understand, that good thinking requires training for it. Now, if assessment and measurement are to inform and to, and to serve pedagogy, a better understanding of what happens in pedagogy, a better understanding of what happens in those teaching and learning processes what's contributing to learning, what's contributing to the failure to learn. Now, refining our measurement of the status of ability has been a major achievement in our field. I applaud my dear friend, the late Bob Glazer, for his leadership in the development of work in this area. I asked Jim Pellegrino to be my co-chair for the commission in large measure because Bob had indicated that what students know, that book probably wouldn't have been done without uh, Jim's uh, support of, uh, of Glazer and that of Kudowski. Knowing what students know, that's us. That's our field. It's our field at its finest. We don't want to set that aside. It's worth celebrating, but it may not be sufficient to inform a conception of education as the cultivation of intelligence, if we borrow Michael Martinez's term. I think Martin is, uh, Michael was inspired by Dick Snow. The cultivation of intelligence, if education and its assessment is about the cultivation of intelligence, we need more than the history of students' achievement. We need more information concerning the processes by which they achieve. Now, I'm convinced that we need to expand, even change direction. What we're doing is simply not good enough. My good friend and mentor, W.E.B. Du Bois, used to claim that it's never too late to stop, to change direction. And he added, especially if you're on the wrong road. It may be that our error is in trying to infer fixity onto human characteristics that we hope that we can measure, that we hope that we can quantify. It may be that such is not rational. I certainly believe that it is not sufficient. Maybe the best metaphor for what we are dealing with has been caught by uh, my neighbor here, Bob, and friend, Bob Sternberg. After spending years in the componential analysis of intelligence, when he was confronted with the task of leading a school of uh, a, a college of liberal arts and the question of who gets, measured, uh, gets admitted and who uh, is not, he comes up with the kaleidoscope as a kind of metaphor for what we were looking at, kaleidoscopic views. Maybe we should at this stage in human evolution only strive to appreciate the images projected in these kaleidoscopic projections. Having been sensitized to them, maybe we can then begin to try to understand them. Maybe we can better apply the insights that come 
from the more careful examination and understanding of these kaleidoscopic uh, views, maybe we can better understand the implications of the data that they provide for teaching and learning. Now, among the best that I think we can currently do may be, in, may be being captured in some of uh, Lauren's, res pardon me, some of Lauren Resnick's work. Lauren talks about responsible talk, responsible dialogue. It is an instructional device, but it could also be an assessment device. One of my students uh, works on Think Aloud protocols. Another of, of our postdocs works with Lauren on responsible talk. And what are they about? They are really trying through the uh, voices and behaviors and attitudes of students to learn what is actually going on in the teaching and learning process. If assessment is to inform those processes, as I said earlier, we've got to understand them. We can do better. We can certainly expand the box. Thank you, Ed. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Andrew Hole for his contributions to my thinking on the topic I plan to discuss this morning. Andrew and I recently co-authored a chapter on the validation of derived scores, and in my work, my remarks this morning, I'm drawing heavily on our work together. The catechism taught in every introductory measurement course holds that validity is a property of a test score interpretation or use, not a property of a test itself. For any given test score, some interpretations or uses may be justifiable, others not. Notwithstanding broad acceptance of this principle, educational administrators, policymakers, and even researchers often act as though the validation of achievement test scores for their original intended interpretation obviates the need for any further investigation of the score's properties. The first place we see this is in the move from test score interpretations to test score uses. An achievement test score interpretation is a descriptive statement, often norm referenced, saying, for example, that scores reflect degrees of mastery of some targeted domain of schooling outcomes, as set forth in the test blueprint. A test score use is often represented by a decision rule of some sort, as when test scores are used for instructional grouping or deciding between promotion versus grade retention. This much has long been recognized. But as Michael Kane reminded us in 2013, the validation of the score interpretation on which a score use is based does not in itself validate the score use. Test publishers typically provide some evidence concerning score meaning, but little or no evidence to support claims for the benefits of using test scores in one way or another. As an aside, I've argued elsewhere that not all score uses take the form of decision rules. Test scores are also used to influence behavior by mechanisms that do not depend directly on the information provided by the scores themselves. If test scores matter, then students and teachers will work to make them higher. Thus, testing is often used deliberately to influence behavior. Students study for exams, educators adjust curriculum and instruction to match the form and substance of accountability tests. Another means of influence is the use of tests to shape popular perceptions of schooling. Some years ago, Elliot Eisner wryly observed that the quickest way to precipitate an educational crisis was to give a test that announced that half the students scored below average. <laughs> Using ambitious cut scores on various tests and labeling everyone scoring lower as less than proficient has yielded endless sound bites decrying the quality of public education. Let me return, though, to my main concern this morning. Lack of attention to validity evidence supporting uses of test scores is a serious concern, but Andrew Ho and I have argued that the problem goes much further. Standardized achievement test score uses today go far beyond what the test's designers ever envisioned. And while the field's theoretical frameworks for test validation are sound and flexible, in our view, they're seriously underutilized. In psychometrics, the characteristic a test is designed to measure is referred to as a construct. A construct is conceived as a latent variable, a 
an attribute of individuals, of schools, whatever the objects of measurement may be, which cannot be directly observed, but which influences test performance. Test scores are used to infer the individual's relative standing with respect to the construct. Typically, the construct an achievement test is intended to measure might be described as a proficiency of an individual student at a single point in time. Uh, it's your status measures. So. <clears throat> However, in recent decades, these same scores have come to be used as the basis for creating various derived scores intended to, intended to measure quite different constructs. Judgmental standard setting is used to establish cut scores, which then serve to place students in categories with labels that invoke unwarranted surplus meanings. Achievement test scores also enter into complex calculations, yielding measurements of students' rate of growth or rate of growth relative to some expectation, as well as attributes of teachers or of schools. The ledgered mean of linking yields to interpretations of scores on one test in terms of score scales and norms for some other test. Uses and interpretations of these derived scores warrant the same kind of scrutiny as we commonly give only to the most obvious interpretations of the raw scores or score scales originally provided by test publishers. Let me give just three examples which illustrate some of the operations used to create these derived scores, then say a bit about validation, and finally close with some brief recommendations. First, consider the classification of some students as English learners, or ELs, and later as reclassified fully English proficient, or RFEPs. Classification procedures are highly variable from place to place and somewhat arcane, but English language proficiency test scores are a major contributing factor. A student's classification as EL, or later as RFEP, significantly affects the instructional program offered to that student, the mix of peers with whom that student associates in the classroom, and arguably the student's academic identity. Based on the meanings and consequences of being EL versus not EL, Andrew and I argue in our chapter that this binary classification should be treated as a construct distinct from the more or less continuous construct of English proficiency. We attach interpretations, we attach meanings to the label EL that go beyond what the, the meanings that we attach to the continuous English language proficiency test score. I should mention we also acknowledge in our chapter that discussing English proficiency as though it were a unidimensional is a gross oversimplification. That, that would be an aside that wouldn't, wouldn't further the argument here. As a second example, consider the popular construct of readiness for college and careers. I can almost hear some of you thinking, must we? <laughs> the Smarter Balanced and Park Assessment Consortia are required to establish cut scores defining achievement levels at which students are college and career ready at the 11th grade level or on track to be college and career ready at lower grade levels. Smarter Balanced, at least, in a worthy but probably futile effort to manage expectations, has scaled back that claim to promise only cut scores signaling, quote, academic preparedness for college, quote, but that nicety seems unlikely to help much. The huge problem here is what psychometricians refer to as construct underrepresentation. College and career, career readiness entails whole domains of knowledge and skill beyond what achievement tests measure. Another problem is that different colleges and different careers have different requirements. Then there's the problem of treating a continuous, multidimensional construct as though it were a simple binary. And finally, there's the problem of an explicitly predictive interpretation that at or above this score, a student will succeed, defined in some way with a specified probability, uh, which ignores all the other contextual factors that influence that prediction. In other words, the logic of the smarter balanced or park cut scores implies that the same cut score must have the same meaning or implication for everyone. Whereas in fact, any given level of test performance will have very different implications for different students, depending on other factors. For my third example, I can't resist returning to teacher value added scores. In teacher value added, students' prior year test scores, usually together with other variables, are used to predict their test scores at the end of the current year. Then that predicted score is subtracted from the student's actual score to obtain a residual. Positive difference means the student did better than predicted and conversely. These residuals are then averaged for all students in a given teacher's classroom. And the resulting number after some further adjustment and scaling is the teacher's value added score. Thus we see the test scores designed to measure individual students' achievement at one point in time 
are thereby used to measure a construct of teacher effectiveness, both the object of measurement, students versus teachers, and the construct, achievement versus effectiveness, have changed. There are a lot of potential problems here. Pressures to teach to the test are ramped up, so the fact that these highly consequential tests measure only a fraction of the domain of valued learning outcomes looms much larger than for lower stakes test uses. The fundamental logic of value added, of value added procedure is to adjust away as much predictable variation as possible in students' test scores, then assume that whatever is left over must be due to the effectiveness of the teacher. Unfortunately, available statistical models are inadequate to account for the non-random and imperfectly known mechanisms whereby students are assigned to teachers and teachers are assigned to schools. Therefore, the value added estimates are likely to be biased in favor of some teachers and against others. The resulting scores are also highly unreliable. Absurd problems are created when these models are mandated by legislative fiat for all teachers in a state, including those teaching untested subjects or at untested grade levels. Obviously, Andrew and I are far from the first to call for careful study of these sorts of testing applications. There's a substantial literature on EL classification, on college and career readiness, and on value-added models. But measurement specialists have contributed less than they might to these investigations. Decades of theoretical and empirical work in the measurement field have given us powerful conceptual frameworks and methods for studying test validity, which ought to guide such work. The most recent edition of the Standards for Educational and Psychological Testing have a bit to say about unintended testing consequences, but apart from standard setting to, ter to determine cut scores, I could find nothing in the standards about the kinds of derived scores I've spoken of here. Our panel this morning was asked to consider how we might ensure the tests are a help and not a hindrance. I would argue that a first essential step is to clearly describe and investigate the, test the ways tests are actually being used. It seems to me that we have some collective blind spots when it comes to modern policy uses of test scores. We might start then by talking and teaching about the kind of construct shifts I've described this morning, clearly labeling derived scores as such, as complicated test scores, and asserting the relevance of traditional measurement considerations. Uh, the NCLB mandated NCLB mandated a binary classification of schools as making, quote, adequate yearly progress, quote, versus being, quote, a need of improvement, quote. But no one talks about this classification as a kind of school-level derived test score. Describing it in that way immediately brings to the fore questions of reliability, validity, bias, and fairness. We also need to clarify roles and responsibilities in carrying out these investigations. For the most part, the 2014 standards I just referred to dodge that question by describing what ought to be done in the passive voice, as in evidence should be collected and made available, or by pushing the responsibility to, quote, those who mandate the use of tests in policy evaluation and accountability contexts and those who use tests in such contexts, end quote. In our chapter, Andrew and I argue that these kinds of derived test score uses are predictable and test developers ought to be paying more attention to them. I have to admit, though, that there are strong disincentives for test developers to do so. Decades ago, Lee Kronbach lamented the confirmationist bias in most test validation. The testing industry is largely unregulated, and neither test developers nor their clients are likely eager to go in search of bad news or to create discoverable records of test flaws likely to fuel future litigation. Still, if we could at least foster an understanding that these derived scores are, in fact, different kinds of test scores, and if we could foster an expectation that the same questions should be asked about these scores as we ask routinely about more familiar scores, that could help considerably. <laughs> Talking about questions concerning reliability, validity, bias, fairness, construct underrepresentation, construct irrelevant variance, rival hypotheses, challenging intended interpretations, construct invariance across examinee groups, as well as what Samuel Messick termed the consequential basis of test interpretation and use. Uses of tests influence behavior or to shape perceptions would also come in for scrutiny here. We have the technical machinery to address these questions, but it's too rarely utilized. Thank you.
my comments this morning um, are connected to the longer piece in the volume you received last night. And I hope that title conveys something of what I would like to argue this morning. <clears throat> if we know so much about research on learning, why aren't educational reforms successful? And the piece that I wrote extends um, an earlier presentation I made um, in my presidential address to the National Academy of Education in 2009 um, about reforms undone, where I looked in some detail at the 1990s reforms that were deeply motivated by what researchers on learning um, knew after 50 years of cognitive science research um, about developed abilities, not innate abilities, about the kinds of thinking opportunities early in life that would make a huge difference for all kids. And that slogan, now a cliche, all kids can learn, really came from a commitment to say that um, a curricular a set of opportunities that had been afforded for just some kids ought to be afforded for all kids. So you could really connect with the intentions of those reforms. Um, ambitious standards were to be set, and in the assessment vein, we, uh, domain, we were to have tests worth teaching to. And I try to give some of the iconic references then um, to how this was all supposed to work, including how accountability was supposed to work. And I remember uh, Eva Baker talking like this about top-down frameworks that would create a set of goals and aspirations and bottom-up kinds of things uh, that would happen. The most famous of the many things that were written at that time was um, Mike Smith and Jennifer O'Day's um, talk about systemic reform. Um, in everything that was written at that time, there was always some talk about capacity building. In other words, this was supposed to be a framework that would help this happen, it wasn't going to make it happen, it was going to support teacher learning and really transformative aspects throughout the entire system. The problem was, and this is what you have to see repeated, so it's a theme I'd like you to think about, these intentions were undone by superficial understandings. You can't expect everyone you talk to about this to have the same deep understanding that our field has about this. Competing visions, so some of the words were taken over by others, and absolute lack of support to make that bottom-up work happen in deep ways. So it became a field of dreams, you know, just set the standards, and somehow expectations alone was going to accomplish what we knew from um, existence proof examples took enormous amounts of work and new kinds of materials and different ways of teaching. The accountable talk, uh, what weren't Lauren's words at those times, but it was the, all of the discourse-based teaching practices. You know, you have to talk aloud through your reasoning so that um, you can actually make sense for yourself and share with others, et cetera. Those kinds of practices were part of the research then. This isn't brand new, but it was not something that got instated if you'd, if you'd never taught that way before and you didn't have support to learn how to do it in these contexts. Instead, it became an incentives, incentive theory of change, very different from what the outline had been. Even before NCLB, performance assessments were abandoned in California after three years. And you can read, uh, I, met, I give you some references in that uh, article about um, what it was about the religious right that didn't like some of the passages and they also didn't like people in Sacramento dictating uh, curricula. Sounds familiar. Um, more importantly to our capacity to do research about these things, I recommend um, work by, um, Martin Corn Carnoy, who was speaking here yesterday, uh, Dick Elmore and Siskin, um, findings that if you impose this shell with no support, it lands in different schools very differently. Importantly, well-resourced schools 
where there's already kind of an internal accountability structure, did very well under these mandates. They made new things, and so they were, there was leverage to do something better, uh, happened, but in poorly resourced schools, where none of this already existed, it was just crazy making. It was um, scrambling, but not a way to find out about the kinds of resources and expertise that were implied by ambitious standards, but not available to certain kinds of schools. It is important to know that some things happened well from those standards, including, um, I think, this is my opinion, that NAEP scores in mathematics at fourth grade went up because it stopped being um, as a result of the NCTM standards, so substantive standards, just arithmetic. Um, talking about uh, and giving explanations would be an example of a practice that had a lot of support from the, um, from the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics, and that was something that did improve and you actually saw lots better performance in fourth grade mathematics over a decade, partly, I think, because of that substantive work. But those examples are rare, and we know that when just the traditional test scores went up, that it didn't necessarily generalize to improvement in NAEP scores. Just as we had evidence in the United States about the negative effects of high stakes testing, uh, in other countries, um, mostly uh, in Great Britain, but also in Australia and in New Zealand, people were worried about the consequences of high stakes testing. And instead of our performance assessment initiative, which marked our answer in this country, in those countries, formative assessment and research on um, the kinds of assessment that support day-to-day -day instruction was the response to that negative evidence. And I should, I should pause and back up just a second to say, if you're not familiar with this literature, what I think is the most compelling uh, evidence about negative effects of high stakes testing. Most people think it's because we have in this country given up on teaching science and social studies uh, and art and that's why now you have STEAM coming back to sort of rescue art curricula. Um, I think if you look closely at uh, studies, it's actually how poorly we came to teach reading and math, the tested subjects. And the kind of research that Bob Lynn and Dan Koritz and I did was looking at whether you could believe the math and reading scores and what kids came to understand about what reading was and the fact that they could not do another problem just like the one they practiced to get ready for the test if it wasn't in the same format. And those harms to teaching and learning um, are buried in sometimes in the rhetoric about high stakes testing. So back to the formative assessment uh, reforms, um, there is a large body of literature both in motivation uh, or self-regulation, uh, if you listen to how Europeans talk about it, uh, and in the metacognitive aspects of learning how to score your own work, helps you internalize criteria about what does a good essay really look like, talk with your peers about how I know that I've improved my essay, etc. There are a million instructional moves that go with what we know about the outcomes of formative assessment practices that were immediately occluded when in this country people said, let's do formative assessment, and they stole the word, hijacked the word, um, when the test companies right after NCLB decided to sell benchmark and interim assessments. And we actually had a little fight at conferences about whether you could call interim assessments formative assessments. Because um, what we said was that's not what the literature was about that said that feedback can be effective. Feedback isn't always effective. In those meta-analyses, it's actually harmful about a third of the time. So what? about the effective studies of feedback. 
could actually support kids learning certainly it not those machine delivered scores to some of the things that ed said about more clinical and interpretive ways of gathering evidence about kids learning the one thing i would ask of all those instruments being sold excessively to school districts to raise scores on the end of year tests by practicing all year long on tests that look just like them it's the idea that formative assessment when it's really good is first of all not every six weeks it's day to day it's one task at a time that's open up open-ended enough to elicit student thinking and cause um, kids in the class to be able to talk about their thinking and it allows support of the learning it's not a score you do not need to have a reliable test score for formative assessment purposes you need to have rich tasks that represent the thinking that you want to elicit and then you have to have a chance to practice among teachers what it takes to challenge and move forward with those kinds of curricular materials. I believe that the incentives and accountability drove out any hope of that kind of reform in this country happening. Similarly, Race to the Top um, initiatives began with asking people in this room to uh, attend uh, regional, uh, locate, regional meetings to give advice uh, to the department. They wrote extensive regs in the RFP about all the things that Park and Smarter Balance would need to do based on our research, including things like capacity building and support, but they also wanted operational tests in three years. And that made it nearly impossible. Those tests may be better than the old tests, but they still land um, as installed mandates on people that don't know how to do it. And that's why you see all of this scrambling. It's only going to be if some of those draconian measures from the top can be lifted that some of the things from the bottom will have a chance to flourish. So the ending lesson is um, that I would have for you is that inevitably cheap, superficial, and coercive visions, versions of reform ideals will always prevent deeply substantive hoped for changes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The two main themes, I think, in the remarks this morning are what is wrong or non-optimal about our assessment in this country, and second, what can we do better? So I'll try to address these rem remarks, uh, summarizing some of what was said and also adding some of my own points. Uh, so the title of my remarks will be standardized testing, fish, fowl, fair, or fraud. Uh, and I'd like to start, I think appropriately, with a test question uh, that's similar to what you would find on a standardized test, or somewhat similar. Who proposed some kind of organized assessment, uh, uh, some kind of organized panel or effort on, on assessment on the part of the National Academy of Education at yesterday's business meeting? Was it George Washington, Vladimir Putin, Alfred Binet, Roger Weisberg, or Ed Gordon? Uh, so it has some bad options, a somewhat plausible option, and then the correct option, which is Ed. Sorry, Roger. Uh, now I would like to do a second test question. What should we do about assessment? Uh, and I would argue, as I think others might, that the first item is similar to what you find on standardized tests, and the second one is what we actually encounter, the kinds of problems we encounter in the world. So if that's the case, then what's the problem with some of the current tests, or maybe many of them? Uh, the first we just saw is the response format. You rarely get problems, almost never in life, where you're given A, B, C, D, and E. 
if my daughter Brittany behaves poorly, she's four, uh, nobody comes and says, you know, here's what you can do, A, B, C, D, or E. If you're having a problem with your spouse, no one comes and says, you know, you can solve it, but the answer is C. Can you figure out, you know, forget it. So the response formats are all wrong. The second thing is that the content misses much of what's important in schooling. It misses arts, it misses music, it often misses science, it often misses social studies, and much more. And most importantly, it misses most of the challenges that are important in life. The third problem is, is a long one, and that's a problem with equity. So I'm going to divide that into parts. Uh, the first problem with equity is culture, and that is that what kids are learning to do in many cultures and subcultures doesn't look much like what's on the standardized test. So when we did research on Kenya, in Kenya on kids' adaptive skills in their environment, what we found is that it was really important for them to learn the, how to treat with natural herbal medicines parasitic illnesses, because that was the biggest problem they're facing in their life. But that's not on the test they got in the school, and in fact, the correlation between their knowledge of the natural herbal medicines and school tests of both intelligence and achievement were negative. So the kids who actually had the better life adaptive skills were the ones who did better, who did worse, on the academic tests, and there's a reason for that, but I don't have time to go into it. When we were studying Eskimo kids in southwest Alaska, we found that the kids knew how to go from one village to another in the frozen tundra, maybe 100 miles on a dog sled in the winter. If their teachers tried to do that, the teachers would die, but when you put the kids in a classroom, the teachers think the kids are stupid. So those kids knew how to do things, hunt fish, ice fish, uh, new natural herbal medicines that were important for their adaptation in their lives, but it didn't count in terms of teachers seeing either their intelligence or their achievement. Uh, a second problem with regard to equity is first language. What's the language that the kids learn in the home? And if they're tested on a second language or a third language, that's hard. So I speak Spanish fluently. But if I were to take an SAT type test in Spanish, I probably wouldn't do very well because I don't have the upper register vocabulary you need for the test. A third problem in terms of equity is socioeconomic status, that when tests say like the SAT were created, they were really created mostly for upper middle class, white, mostly male students in high school who went to prestigious prep schools. And they may have made sense at the time, but they weren't taking into account that years later there would be a much broader range of SES taking the test. Fourth problem is ethnicity. Uh, in studies with Lynn Okagaki, we found that Asian and white parents tend, tend to emphasize cognitive skills in their definitions of intelligence, but Latino parents tend more to emphasize social skills. But the teachers of all the kids more emphasize cognitive skills, so in terms of the teacher's implicit theories of intelligence, the Asian and white kids look smarter and the Hispanic kids looked less smart because they weren't a match to what they thought was important for intelligence. Uh, a fifth problem is that we assume that static tests can tell you a lot about ability and achievement. But in fact, many of the kids taking these tests, especially from lower SES or diverse cultural backgrounds, don't even quite understand what they're supposed to do on them. And when we were testing kids in Tanzania, we found that when we gave kids ability and achievement tests, testing them statically, most of the kids looked very stupid and low in achievement. But when we gave them dynamic tests along the lines of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, and we gave them a pretest, and then we gave them some instruction on how to take these tests and then a post-test, the Tanzanian kids looked much better. And moreover, it was the post-test that ultimately was more predictive of other kinds of achievements. Another problem is learning and thinking styles, and that is that the standardized tests we use tend to support what I sometimes call an executive style of thinking. You give me the problem, I'll solve it. They don't tend to support what I sometimes call a legislative style of thinking, which is I don't really want your problem, I want to come up with a problem and solve it. And so what ends up happening is that kids who are good at doing what they're told to do, do better. And what we found in our research that it was that in one school, which happened to be a Catholic parochial school, this executive style was very highly correlated with a better achievement, whereas in a, a private, more mod school, 
Um, it was the opposite. The legislative style was correlated with high achievement. In other words, what was correlated with high achievement actually differed by sign between the two schools depending on what kinds of learning styles they valued. Another problem is the context of testing, uh, and that is that there are kids who can do well on the street or in their lives, but they can't do well in a classroom. And the classic study there is Terezinha Nunez's study of Brazilian street kids who could do the math in the context of the street, but put them in a classroom and give them math problems, they can't do them. And G. Leif found the same thing among housewives in Berkeley. So, the last thing, and what I think is the most important thing, is the creation of self-fulfilling prophecies. And, and this, I've seen this through three generations of Sternbergs. So when I was young, I did poorly, you know, in elementary school, they gave IQ tests every couple of years. I did poorly on the tests. My teachers thought I was stupid. I thought I was stupid. They were happy. I was stupid. I was happy. They were happy. Everyone was pretty happy. So self-fulfilling prophecy until I had a teacher who thought that there was more to a kid than a standardized test. Well, that was, you know, in the 1800s, you might say, that was too long ago. Uh, then I have a son, Seth, who is 36 and very successful an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Uh, he makes too much money, and he really should give me more of it, but they, you don't care. Okay, so with, with Seth, uh, he's in the top reading group in one school. Uh, we then moved to another district, and the first thing they do his first day of school is they give him a reading test to see where they, where they should place him and what happens. Well, on the reading test, he bombs out, which is not surprising when you're in a new school for the first day with new teachers, new building, new community, new kids. So they put him in the bottom reading group. So he goes from the top to the bottom reading group. Very bad time to test, bad context. After a while, they notice he's better reading better than the kids in the bottom group, so they put him in the second group only after they give him a reading test. So they didn't care that he was reading better than the kids. It was the reading test that counted. Then they notice he's reading better than the kids in the second group. So, of course, we know the reading doesn't count. They give him a reading test. He scores at the level of the first group. So, of course, they're going to put him in the first group. Eh, they don't. They leave him in the second group. So his mother and I go into school and ask, well, why didn't you put him in the top group? And they say, well, it's because he's now a full year behind the kids in the top group. And we point out, well, that's because you put him in the bottom group when he didn't do well in the reading test. And they say, well, you know, that's the way he tested. So we offer to work with him at home. And I was studying reading at the time, and my wife at the time was the commissioner of education in Connecticut with a PhD in curriculum from Stanford, so we both knew something about reading. I said, we don't allow the reading books to go home. So that was the end of that one. Now, that was two generations. Uh, my triplets are four, and when they were two, uh, their English language acquisition was a little slow. So we brought them to a psychologist. Uh, this was just two years ago. Uh, and the psychologist diagnosed all three of them as on the autism spectrum. Uh-oh. Uh, well, now they're four and they're fluently bilingual. What she didn't take into account is that they were premature in their birth, they're triplets, and their first language is German. So three generations of potentially self-fulfilling prophecies, it hasn't changed. So one might ask, why are we stuck in a box? Why are we stuck where we are? Well, I think there's several reasons. One is inertia that we just have trouble making changes. Medical tests have changed enormously since the early 1900s. You wouldn't want to you know, have cancer and be diagnosed according to early 20th century tests, but that's what we do in education. We use early 20th century tests. The second reason is similarity, that the people making the judgments, well, guess who they are? The people who do well on the tests. And the fundamental principle of interpersonal attraction is that we tend to be attracted to people who are like ourselves. So, People who did well in tests look for people who do well in the tests. The third reason is what I call pseudo-quantitative precision. The test results look very exact, whether they are or not. A fourth reason is superstition. If you go up to an elevator and the button is lit and you keep pressing it, and even though it's lit, the elevator will come. So the conclusion you reach is that if the elevator is lit and you keep pressing the button, it will come faster. Well. That sounds kind of ridiculous. We wouldn't do anything that stupid and superstitious in education. But when I was director of graduate studies at a very large university in New Haven, Connecticut, which I won't mention the name of, uh, it was pointed out to me when I said we should take some kids with lower GREs, especially kids from underrepresented minority groups. They said, well, you know, you have to admit that most of the kids here have GRE scores, at least the kids who are successful, over 650. 
And I said, yeah, you know, you're right. That is true. And the reason is we never accept kids with GREs under 650. Elevator. Um, uh, uh, sixth reason is that an awful lot of people in institutions profit from the current system. So what I've discovered recently is that there are you know, the test companies like it. The admissions offices are used to using it. Parents sort of know the game. There are all these preparation companies. There are just a lot of different places that profit. Um, a seventh is the competition among schools, so they're all competing to be there. So the question is, what can be done? So what I think all of the panelists were saying in different ways is that we need a theory, a good theory, of exactly what it is we're testing instead of sort of shooting in the dark. And several people have proposed theories that could be used. Howard Gardner has, David Perkins has, Steve Cece has, I have. So I just want to say a few words about my own experience. So based on uh, the theory of successful intelligence was basically that being successfully intelligent means that you have the skills to figure out what you want in life and the skills to go ahead and achieve it within your sociocultural context through a combination of creative skills to come up with new ideas, analytical skills to know if they're good ideas, practical skills to be able to implement the ideas and persuade others of their value, and wisdom-based skills in order to ensure that they help achieve some kind of common good. So in a number of projects, a rainbow when I was at Yale, Kaleidoscope at Tufts, Panorama at Oklahoma State, University of Michigan Business School, we now, AP, you know, advanced placement, uh, graduate school project, we keep finding the same thing. That we can separate out creative and practical abilities from analytical abilities, that we can improve uh, prediction of academic performance over SAT, that we can improve prediction of extracurricular activities, and that kids actually like to take the tests. So what? So we thought, all right, my wife and I thought, hey, let's talk to some administrators and see if they'd actually be interested in doing this. So what happened? What happened was, so we first talked to a university president in a large university, urban university, he said, you know what you're doing is the exact opposite of what universities try to do. And that is what you're trying to do is a strengths-based approach where you help kids get in, but most universities are more concerned about rejecting kids. So what they want to do is use the test to screen kids out, and it reminded me when I was a dean at Tufts, I was the same way. The higher the rejection rate, the better it looked for the university. So then we go to talk to the admissions dean at a small college, and he says, well, you know, my big problem isn't getting kids who are more diverse. You know, your measure uh, increases diversity by decreasing ethnic group differences because different kids are good at different patterns of abilities. That isn't my big deal. My big deal isn't getting a more diverse class. It's getting full-paying students. And then I realized, you know, I understand now why the standardized tests are so hard to get rid of. And it goes back to the beginning of the talk. It goes back to why it is that in the 1950s, the average SATs at Harvard were in the 500s, and now they're so much higher. Basically, the tests do what socioeconomic status did before. And for colleges that want full-paying students, instead of doing it by what private school they went to or what their last name is, you can do it by giving standardized tests. So self-fulfilling prophecies have affected Sternbergs in three generations, me, Sammy and uh, uh, Seth in our triplets, Sammy, Brittany, and Melody. And what I'm hoping is that in the fourth generation, something will be different. Thanks for listening. Uh, you've, you've heard now a variety of perspectives. I would call it a little bit of the good, but a lot of the bad and the ugly. Um, and I, I, before I open it up, to the audience, because we do have some time until 10, I would sort of pose a question to the panelists. Um, in, given all we know, and given the sets of issues, um, and, and given that um, the Academy and those of us on this platform and others have been working on these issues, if, if there, are young, there are young scholars out there who are here, the pre-doc and the, and the post-docs, what, what advice would we give to them about ways in which they could essentially think about these issues of assessment and the ways in which educational research might contribute to addressing some of the many challenges that have been talked about here? What, what are some sensible ways for them to take on some of the issues and maybe make a contribution in what is admittedly a very challenging environment? So, 
Um, I'll, I'll ask our senior scholar at the end to lead off there, if he would sort of think about that. Jim, I was hoping you wouldn't turn to me first. <laughs> Being a senior scholar, my mind doesn't work as fast as these people. <clears throat> But I never pass up an opportunity to talk. <laughs> I think young people, if I were either starting in this field or you're not really starting, if you were where you are in this field, given your uh, abilities and accomplishments, I think I would ask what it is that education most needs. Where could I possibly do something that might make a difference? And I will tell you, and this will reflect my bias, I don't think it's trying to measure more carefully uh, what it is people know. Almost uh, 50, I guess it's maybe closer to 60 years ago now, I had the pleasure of working with a brilliant young uh, teacher. She was a woman who left Germany because she didn't want to see her nation abusing uh, people like they were then abusing the Jews. But she was uh, a specialist in the education of neurologically impaired kids. And she spent most of her career in this country trying to study what it was those kids did and did not do in their learning that could better inform what she would do as teacher. Her work kind of dropped out of, off the scene uh, before 1960, largely because it took too much time. But if you were to invest your efforts in thinking about investigating what it is that learners and their t teaching buddies, their teachers, need to better enable individual learners uh, to learn, uh, that's, that's where I'd, I would put my energies. And I don't know that we're going to come up uh, t t tomorrow with the answers. One of the modest receptions of the uh, Gordon Report, I think, was that we were much too uh, theoretical, ab abstract. We didn't have some things you could do tomorrow. And if you look at what we now do pretty well, that is measuring ability, we didn't get there in one day. It took us some time to get there. But we need to define the right problem to work on. And right now, I think the problem that we need to work on, uh, just as it has been in medicine for a while, in pedagogy, is trying to understand what it is teaching and learning people do and need to do and are not doing and the context in which it operates to better inform the process of intervention. Thanks, Ed. Bob, do you want to? We'll just go down the line. Here. Yeah, uh, I would suggest the young scholars think about McDonald's uh, because every time McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's introduces a healthy option onto the menu, it doesn't last very long. Everybody says they want it, and then when they have the opportunity to buy it, they don't buy it. And what I've discovered in recent years is the biggest problem we have in assessment is the same one. I think we have a lot of better ideas. Lori talked about some of them, Ed, Ed. You know, there are just a lot of, there are a lot of good assessments there to be had, but the incentive system isn't consistent with what's there. Uh, the incentive system in terms of what's easy to use, uh, what testing companies want to support, what customers are ready to buy, what's easy to understand. And so I think we have to do what McDonald's needs to do, and that is how can we create incentives such that these better ideas in testing than what we have will start getting used so we're not doing the equivalent of using in the 21st century, uh, early 20th century medical tests or fast food. Thanks, Bob. Lori? Um, I think I can build right on the uh, McDonald's analogy. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, um, that those of you who are qualitative researchers should understand that you're not off the hook um, because you uh, are making inferences all the time. 
and um, in your own classes with your students, um, you're signaling uh, what's important to do um, and how you're going to assess their performance uh, is something that we all ought to try to be good at. Um, I think for research purposes, the standards are different from what they should be for a large-scale testing program as uh, Ed was outlining. And the problem, that's the problem, is that people don't understand that difference. Like what approximation in essay scoring, for example, um, machines are driving out teachers because machines are more reliable. But that's not useful because the kind of coaching toward what an individual teacher thinks is the kind of support that helps a student get better, not what the machine on average um, treats as its criterion. So when you try to move from what this rich, de thick description looks like in a classroom between you and a student, you can't lift that and install it as a national or state level testing system. You will always take shortcuts. And I'm in favor of gathering data. I work, I have devoted 30 years to supporting validity studies of the National Assessment of Educational Progress. I'm in favor of data collection at that level of touch. I think it's ludicrous to think that the state assessments can turn around and do that accurately. Um, as soon as you um, have to live politically with the opt-out movement, you realize it's not about data at all. Uh, it's about um, coercion. Uh, so I think we should think about what we want to do for data. So policy people um, don't collude with the policy makers to do top-down installed systems as if you could make instruction better with that. You ask hard questions, Jim. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I have any advice that I'd give to ev everyone, but uh, my first, the, f the first thing that came to mind was to look hard at what a test performance actually calls <coughs> for. Test performance is a performance. It's it's scripted. The administrator reads the lines from a, t a text. Uh, there are props that are used, the answer sheets and so forth. It is a highly constrained, highly artificial setting that we put people into when, when they take a test. Those who know the rules of that game do better, as Bob was reminding us. Uh, those who don't know the rules do worse. Uh, what one actually is doing is highly artificial. You're, at, you're demonstrating skills not for any authentic purpose, not to solve a problem of your own crafting or of personal interest, but merely for the sake of demonstrating that you're capable of doing it for some other kind of audience. Uh, so just having that frame of reference in mind, of just what, what, would, what it is that testing actually amounts to, and also having in mind the incredibly long and mostly hidden chain of reasoning and theory that links that performance to things that matter about what we can actually do in the real world is important. I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, hesitant to go this direction because it seems it might be an invitation to an easy cynicism about testing, and that's not what I intend. Test scores are predictive of important learning, of important things that people can do. The reasons for their, their predictive power are often more complicated and more freighted than we'd like to think. Uh, test our proxies for socioeconomic status. But the, the first thing to do is just to be aware of what the test score actually is and not simply take it at face value. Then I'd, I'd second what Laurie said about alternative ways of collecting information, keeping track of what tests uh, are actually measuring and what, what is of interest in one's own research within, within whatever methodological traditions <coughs> what one is working. <coughs> Um, we have a tendency to take whatever answer is out there as the answer to whatever question we would like to ask. And uh, in fact, tests are answering some particular questions. They probably are not answering the questions that really matter to us. So I guess I'm just encouraging skepticism. 
Thank, thank you all. I'm sure this group could continue to sort of offer advice, but I want to open things up to the audience for questions to be directed to any member of the panel. I'm sure that many of the issues and concerns shared up here are shared by members of the academy, so I'd like to sort of open things up and allow folks to raise questions or um, offer their thoughts on many of these same issues. There's a microphone over there, and I can't see the light shine. I think there's one over there. Michael. Thank you. That was fascinating. I really appreciate, um, Jim, the way you organized this panel. And um, we've been working on th these problems have been with us for a long time. I, I, I just want to offer two anecdotes and then ask a more substantive policy question. First anecdote has to do with the first psychologist I met and spoke to about testing when I drifted into this line of work back in 1988. Uh, Shep White, many of you probably remember Shep White of blessed memory. And Shep's recommendation to me and to the people working on the project at the time was to try to encourage the community to stop using the word measurement and to substitute estimation. And I th I've always thought about that. and. This goes partly, I think, to Bob Sternberg's reminder about the pseudoscientific uh, aura that attends to results from our various kinds of assessment, which lead to the kind of uh, interpretation by a lot of people that these outcomes are very precise. And the better that psychometrics has become, the more precise things look but the precision is actually having a hard time catching up with the uh, impression. So just I wonder whether there's a way for our community to think about Shep's um, suggestion. The second thing, the second anecdote is um, the story that my parents told me that they were in New York City and they observed a young mother pushing a baby in the stroller, and somebody coming along and saying, oh my, you have such a beautiful baby. And the mother said, oh, that's nothing. You should see the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Which again has stuck with me as a metaphor of the ways in which we have somewhat perhaps uh, unconsciously drifted into allowing these pictures to substitute for the real thing, and that has led to this perhaps overzealous uh, reliance on pictures um, instead of something that might be less blurry. Uh, my question is this. Um, if one were to substitute in this conversation uh, something about the quality of television, one would remember, uh, I think it was Newton Minow, uh, the barren wasteland mm -hmm. of commercial television, which sort of led to the development of something called the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Public Broadcasting Service, and now we have National Public Radio. And leaving aside whatever you think about the politics of all of that, the question is whether from a policy standpoint, there would be any hope in establishing something like what happened with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting for the development of a whole uh, new infrastructure of educational assessment, measurement or estimation, that could then be used by states and localities uh, at, their, at their will, uh, much the way local television stations choose to affiliate or not with what happens on public broadcasting. It's just a, an idea. I think I've, I threw that idea out in one, one, of, one paper. It was probably at Bob, for Bob Lynn's Festschrift paper that I suggested this. I'm just curious whether the panel wants to respond to that. Who would like to respond? Uh, I'm, 
I'm happy to try to respond. I think that um, if I want to try to be optimistic at all uh, about ESEA, uh, ESEA reauthorization, it would be that um, s s there'll be some trust busting going on and some um, making room, going back to the states, perhaps making room for local experiments. So I would be in a favor of, you know, keeping national assessment. We want some monitor data over time to keep track of what happened when we um, did too much of one thing and then maybe made some room for some other things. Um, and then I think that um, important investments on a small scale that allowed for curricular and assessment development concurrently. That's what we are, are driving out. Every time you put all of your efforts into the assessment and then just let people scurry to figure out how to do it well. By the way, they can't even give you feedback on the adequacy of those materials uh, because it has to stay in place to measure change over time. Um, build it smaller. Um, there were NSF curricular materials in the 90s that had some very positive effects. Um, ironically, at that time, they did their assessment development separate from their um, curricular development. So um, I think things that would let people try this, I've suggested replacement units where it would be integrated um, so that people could learn how to do it. That's not the same thing as scoring it and adding it up. So see, uh, that's another example. The consortia stole that idea too. Uh, and they said, oh, we'll have through t throughput tests. And I was thinking like, you're gonna measure them in October uh, add up that score and keep it till the end of the year as if they're not going to learn anything more about that thing. Um, so it's, it's like the, the corruption every time you try to take a good idea and install it, it ruins it. So why not just make room for something at the ground? Um, we even recommended in our white paper consortia but it was turned into to create the high stakes assessment. No, no, no. It's to allow some of this development, study it, learn from it, let teachers participate in improving it the way they do in the countries we want to be like. Um, and it's a very different model. Let me just add a, a follow, quick follow up to that. Uh, what Lori just described is precisely what was recommended in a report that Ed was part of, and Mark Wilson and I co-chaired it, which was how to build, how to think about assessment that would support the vision for science education that was found in the NRC framework and the Next Generation Science Standards. And it was to build this thing completely from the bottom up or inside out. That is, start with supporting teaching and learning and then build out to the monitoring. And there is an opportunity there, but it's going to depend on other aspects of the policy context. So in, in, in I think, you know, the suggestions are there. The issue is whether or not we can create the space for, for experiments like that. Maybe reauthorization of ESEA will allow that. We just don't know. Bob? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, Mike, I really loved your picture metaphor. I just wanted to make a comment on that because it was very similar to what I was talking about with Seth when the school cared more about the reading test scores than they cared about his reading. They just didn't care about how he read. They cared about the test score. And that's the way our society is. We care more about an IQ or an SAT score than what kids actually achieve. I mean, like, who cares what they achieve? It's the test that matters. And the problem is that people will always care a lot about pictures. I mean, you know, all of us do. And, you know, pictures give you a chance to look at your best. Look your best. So what I think is the problem is that the pictures are fuzzy, they're black and white, and they're only when kids are dressed up. But the real problem is that because schools are of such different quality, kids get different opportunities to dress up. So some of them who go to prosperous schools can look really good, and others who don't go to those kinds of schools, when they get in front of the camera, they don't look as good. So given that people are always going to use the pictures, the best we can do is improve our schools, improve our cameras, and just realize that pictures are always going to be appealing to people. Thank you. So, <clears throat> In relation to what the panelists were saying about opening up a, an opportunity for experimentation, mm -hmm. ah, sorry. Uh, Sarah Sparks from Education Week. Um, 
I wonder if there's a capacity. Could you speak to capacity issues there? Because if you're opening it up to more local experimentation, doesn't that also introduce differences in the capacity of school districts? I mean, the exact same thing you were talking about earlier with NCLB, the, the wealthier school districts were able to make that an opportunity, and the ones that had very low resources, it was just one more <coughs> burden and crazy making. Asking the, the school districts to experiment with what is the best kind of assessment we can develop, doesn't that again create an inequity with schools who don't have the resources to dedicate to coming up with really cool new assessment techniques? Um, if that's directed at me, um, yeah, I, I, um, I think we have to get the, uh, the, the unit of analysis right here. Uh, so I'm not saying every school should do that development. I'm saying that uh, curricular resources could be developed. Uh, they could even be developed as, and by, they could be developed nationally as long as there's choice. Um, and as long as this integration takes place, they would not be a national curricula. So um, NSF developed multiple ones back uh, in the day. Um, you could have various consortia developing them so that they, um, kind of like FOSS kits are one example that lots of people have experience with, where there's a rich resource that every school could not develop. So I agree with you completely. You don't leave it to every school uh, because then you perpetuate the existing inequity. So the question is, is that states? Is that consortia of states? Is it some federal agencies uh, or uh, national consortia of various kind that make these available? And importantly, you don't decide you're going to score it to add it up to uh, allocate rewards and punishments. That is critical to any bottom-up effort having the chance to work. And you have the th research behind it that we've talked about, the learning theory behind it, and you provide professional development around those things. Instead of one month you do literacy professional development, and then completely differently, you have benchmark preparation professional development. Those things are right now detached, and they need to be uh, coherent and reconnected. Marcia? I think that's huh. you, the light's shining. <laughs> <laughs> Marsha Lynn from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, this is a fascinating panel and I think such an important set of issues for us today in education. And I guess I'm trying to look for a leverage point that might move us more quickly and more uh, advantageously in the directions that all of you are recommending. Um, and frankly, you're all saying that we might need to keep tests, but on the other hand, the tests are uh, standing in the way of real progress and of actually responding to the needs of teachers and students to improve learning. And I think you've all also said that uh, we really need to look at the process that goes on in the classroom, the, the interactions between the students and the teachers, and we need a richer set of information about what's going on at that time, not some crazy test that uh, is really disconnected from how students read or whatever. And you know, it seems to me that we really do have in our technologies today a chance to really gather the kinds of information in a continuous way that could both give students a sense of how they're doing and and give them a sense of being able to set their own goals based on what they see is happening um, and what kinds of guidance we can give them. We now can use natural language uh, processing tools to actually score essays and give students guidance that isn't just right, wrong answers, but really tells them uh, some ideas to think about in order to revise their essays and, and to think more clearly. And we also have um, uh, the ability to give this information rather quickly to teachers so that they can adjust their instruction much more rapidly, and we can even give them some suggestions about, you know, kind of a recommender system. Amazon actually has, you know, proved that this works, um, or perhaps doesn't work, but at any rate, um, a teacher who has this kind of student can look to see what someone else did as an opener the next morning and think about, oh, I guess that that's a suggestion that I could do, too, to make my students think more deeply about these issues. So I guess that my question is, so, I mean, should we have a moratorium on testing and try to really work in the direction of uh, instituting these other 
techniques that focus on what we know are the real needs in classrooms um, in order to break this cycle. Uh, I'm not sure if we need a moratorium on testing altogether, but I think we need more room for local experimentation. Your point about technology is well taken. One of the things that technology can enable us to do is to construct formative assessments that are much more tightly linked to the antecedent instruction that are truly curriculum embedded. Uh, one problem with attempts at using large-scale assessments for formative purposes is that they're, they're not enough, closely enough tied to what kids have actually specifically learned in the classroom. Uh, in, in the classroom discourse, a teacher can build up a vocabulary of ideas and concepts that can then be in, uh, interrogated in, in the assessment. Uh, if you know what particular Shakespeare play a child has read, then you can ask questions about the specifics of character development and plot and foreshadowing and so on. If all you know is that they've read a Shakespeare play, it's much more difficult to really probe deeply those kinds of understandings. Uh, in Tyler's eight-year study from 1936 to 1938, he arranged for a moratorium on, uh, on the part of colleges that would be admitting the students from the standard admissions tests, accepting instead <coughs> the comprehensive examinations that he was developing uh, as, as evidence for, for entry. Lori, when you did that work in Colorado, working with school districts on trying to implement curriculum reform using uh, performance assessments in mathematics, you obtained an agreement or a suspension of state testing requirements for several years. Uh, the idea was posed of, of having small scale experiments. If we can give local waivers, not necessarily a moratorium overall, but places where people can uh, set aside the, the high stakes testing uh, mandates long enough to give some of these ideas a chance to work and if we can have curriculum materials and assessments developed in tandem, so we really have that linkage that enables us to probe more deeply, I think we can make some real progress. Technology can help. David? Yeah, uh, David Pearson, uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, two or three thoughts. First of all, uh, I'm glad, uh, Marcia, that you brought up the issue of technology because the irony that I see is that we're using technology like essay scoring for summative purposes when, in point of fact, the real need is for formative pur purposes to get information to teachers and kids. We could still, if we wanted, um, uh, involve uh, uh, human scoring in, in the summative assessments for the the kind of uh, the washback that that would have for teachers on, on building good curricula. Uh, the second thought I have is that, um, and Ed, I was really glad to hear you talk about the distinction between sort of the data level, the interpretive level, and the level of use uh, of, uh, of information. And it strikes me that one of the things that, as a field, that we haven't been as uh, paid as much attention to as we might is the uh, the the decision, the validity of decisions at the level of how we use tests, uh, you know, out out in out in the world, and this gets us back, of course, to uh, uh, Messick's notion of con of the the consequ consequential basis of uh, of validity, uh, and uh, I think that would be a, a, a marvelous new initiative for uh, some uh, of the younger scholars to undertake to look at, you know, the quality and impact and the dark side of the decisions that are uh, made on the basis of uh, the use of tests. I just want to say one caution about technology. I agree with what you've, what Marcia and David have both said. However, this is an example of where it can go very bad very quickly. Uh, what's out there right now is being sold, and you can go to the Crest uh, UCLA website and see a 2010 report that um, Brian Stetcher and I did uh, where we uh, looked at how teachers were using interim assessments. And what they get back is a subtest or sometimes item grid by student. They reteach the worst one thing, uh, and um, they single out the students with the lowest scores and uh, usually assign them to someone else uh, for additional work. There is no substantive information about how to improve. It is a score that ranks kids. Um, and so the problem with um, essay scoring is what the algorithm actually looks like, and if it's just sentence lengths 
and word counts and things that correlate highly, it is not what we want to use to give feedback to individual students about what they can do to improve. That should be substantive. It should not be what's happening in schools with interim tests, posting on the wall outside the principal's office what the scores are by classroom, and it should not be telling kids that to get better, they need two more items correct. Try harder. Could I add to what Laurie said? In a talk I give on some of our assessments, I show two essays that we actually got from Kaleidoscope at Tufts, and they're both pretty well written, and one is really super creative, and as soon as you see it, you just know, wow, this is someone I would like to see in any university. And the other is extremely well written, but just not very creative. And any e-scoring technique is going to mark the analytically stronger one as the better essay, and it is a better written essay, but almost any university would rather have the first kid who is maybe not quite as good a writer, but really was very innovative. So the problem is, as Laurie said, is what are you scoring for? Are you just scoring for uh, the kinds of things that are mechanical, which is what an e-score is good at, or are you scoring for the things you really care about? Is the person creative? Does the person have common sense? Is the person wise? Do they show any ethical judgment? I also wanted to make a comment on Marsha, uh, Marsha's remark. Uh, I was once in Turkey where they use tests even more than we do, and I asked uh, this guy at the University of Eastern, but why do you put such incredible emphasis on tests uh, so that er all the determinations are, better on, uh, are determined on tests? And what he said was interesting, and that is that when we used to do it without tests, what determined who made it in was pull. It was uh, how much influence your parents had or how much they were willing to pay or what your social class was or your caste or whatever it is. So the advantage of tests was going to be to get rid of the system where it was your private school or your skin color or your religion or your race or whatever it is. Uh, and th that was a well-intentioned effort, and it probably made sense in the early 1900s when there was a very homogeneous population applying. What's happened, as was pointed out by several people, is that because the tests are so highly correlated with socioeconomic status, ethnicity, and other variables, essentially we have a proxy for what we did before, but now it gives the guise of meritocracy without taking into account the vast range of kinds of knowledge and skills that diverse students could bring to a school if they were only allowed to. Okay. I'm Todd Rocker from University of New Mexico. Um, Park scores were just released this week, and only a quarter of our students in the state were deemed uh, proficient. And I know our secretary is already putting a spin on this, and I know that you know these scores are going to be used punitively against <clears throat> students and teachers and work I'm documenting. And, um, you know, I plan. You know, I'd probably go fire off some letters to the editor on the plane. But I'm curious to hear from you on ways to successfully engage, you know, policymakers in the state um, and the public as well, and kind of take our work. I agree with a lot of that was said today as well. Um, and maybe you know, experiences you've had in doing that work, our advice for newer scholars trying to get into shape those broader conversations. I can give you. Uh, Ed's the expert on. Uh, uh, the lament against cut scores uh, that create these false categories. And now you have the double duty effect of changing the assessment content dramatically uh, before you've let people teach to these new standards and you have cut scores that are meaningless. Um, what, what I did in Colorado when the first proficient scores were set a couple decades ago um, and we knew then, because we had the data, that they were set at the 70th percentile. So that's one thing you can say, is where are they being set? Because the, the hardest thing about the word proficient, and watch how many times this is alighted in how the, public, uh, how the media talks about it, they call it grade level. And so people use their old joke about uh, above average, most people actually know, um, or have this memory that grade level is the average for that grade. Um, substitute proficient, which has been set someplace very different from the 50th percentile, but people still um, exclaim in horror that so many people are below that cut. 
So what I did with um, a couple of school boards was actually um, work with a lo um, test director in um, one district and gather essays that had been written by kids at each level. So I had I could just do a simple, you know, crude, crude equating of his, here's what the advanced kids look like, here's what the proficient kids look like. And what was amazing was to show school board members what the essays written by the kids um, looked like who were in the partially proficient and therefore terrible category. Um, and it really did turn around some of the rhetoric locally, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't save us uh, nationwide. I think that's Lauren. Yeah, it is. But I have to do this. <laughs> I can't see. Um, I've been astonished by the turn of the conversation. This is an extremely distinguished panel, and you t taught us in, in a deep way what's wrong with what's going on. And then when it came to the discussion, I think all five of you, in one way or another, uh, tried to rescue the system, and, and your proposals are well. Let's do this to fix it a little. Uh, that's how that's how I was hearing it. So I want to pose the, I think the radical alternative. Why don't we try giving it up for a while? Make school districts or even states. I really haven't thought about the right units here. I uh, petition for a waiver of not doing testing rather than the other way around. I, I know that, that the literal form of that statement is rather ridiculous, but the idea underneath it could probably be worked on. Yay. <laughs> uh, I have a loud voice, and there seems to be some uh, feedback with the mic, so I'm just trying to speak out. Uh, I am um, shocked by the... Um, uh, the pessimism, I would say even despair, <laughs> that I hear from uh, uh, members of the panel and members of the audience about our current state. And I wonder uh, what uh, those of us here who deal with policy uh, think the current state of mind is of the groups who, uh, uh, who control such uh, issues as as uh, whether tests will be high stakes. Don't we need to uh, lower the emphasis on testing and not have so much of, of, uh, of what we're doing determined by a rather silly super uh, test? And um, I, I guess we have to start then with the, uh, an analysis of what the state of mind of chief state school officers, uh, <laughs> school board associations, uh, and so on. Uh, but it seems to me uh, that's the only real solution. Somebody want to comment? Uh, that's a, a fascinating idea and would be a, well worthwhile to in, engage in. I've been struck in dealing with uh, people in various, situated in various ways in the system at how highly constrained individuals' choices are. It's easy to imagine bad guys here or there, but I think about the State Board of Education in California, a well-intentioned group of, I think it's 16 people who meet every other month who are charged with, with managing and overseeing and improving education in the thousands of public schools in California. They can't possibly do that in any realistic way, hands-on. They, they need mechanisms, they need rules, they need procedures and structures. Uh, they're caught up in a, in a web of expectations and regulations and various agencies and, and interests. And it's very, very difficult to find the, the bad guys who are responsible for the emphasis on high stakes testing. It's a, it's a systemic matter and I think the only solution is going to be a thoughtful um, formulation of alternative ways of doing business and then a, a gradual uh, effort of education of, and changes in, in lots of places simultaneously to shift the system to some new way of doing business over time. I would like to second what Ed said. Um, my interpretation isn't the same as yours, Lauren, or actually the same as yours, uh, Dick, and that is I think that we just can do much better with testing. Uh, if we had assessments that measured creativity and there are available tests that are good, that measured common sense, that measured 
uh, wise and ethical thinking as well as analytical thinking that measured some of Gardner's different intelligences, uh, then I think that the assessments, the picture wouldn't be so different from the reality. The problem is that we're using a picture that is very constrained. You know, it's like eyes that only can see straight ahead. But if we were to look more comprehensively at the whole child rather than just a little piece of him or her, I don't think that there would be anything wrong with assessment and that assessment then would become strengths-based and better help kids to figure out what they can do well and how to capitalize on it and what they don't do well and how to either compensate for it or correct it. So I don't think the problem is assessment, it's just that we can do a much better job of it. So uh, let, me, let me just say this is a point of disagreement um, that uh, Ed and I have gently had previously um, and that I'm disagreeing with Bob and I just think it's a productive conversation. I do agree that we can assess those other things and that when you attend to them, teacher to student, um, parent and child, um, and nurture performance toward those things. You are assessing, and we can actually uh, create um, materials, instruments, and attentiveness to support teachers paying attention to those things and help kids get better at them. But that is to uh, create some of these materials and attention for instructional purposes is not the same thing as saying I would ever agree that we can adequately aggregate it up and report on a school that's good at teaching create creativity scored by one of these assessments. And that is a fundamental disagreement. We cannot ever get there. Um, and we are in an environment where there are teachers teaching to dibbles that means they are teaching nonsense syllables because that has been picked up by a district um, and is being used at grade levels um, to actually score kids on early reading. So that's the environment we're in and that's what has to be scaled back and removed so that we could have a light touch monitoring assessment like national assessment and create space uh, I am in favor of taking away the state assessments if we thought we could get away with it. If we're going to leave them in place, we have to take away uh, VAM-based uh, teacher accountability. Right now, the modal years served by teachers is one. We are losing teachers so fast that the most frequent years of teaching is one. And I can't get students to come into teacher education and even the alternative programs that we're offering to do it cheaper are losing enrollments dramatically because of what we've done to the climate around what it means to be a teacher these days. So it's a, it's a pervasive picture that this assessment story is, is very instrumental in, in having created. I'm looking at the time and I see we have two more folks so I'm going to sort of limit us to the last two folks who are queued up and then uh, we will call an end to the session. So go ahead please. Uh, Sam, <coughs> Sam Weinberg, Stanford. Um, thank you very much for this panel. Um, as I was listening to the panelists, I was thinking uh, back to a book review that Bob Stake wrote of the Jones and Olkin assessment of NAEP uh, that came out in 2004. And Bob Stake uses a metaphor in that essay to try to explain the, the kind of conundrums that we are dealing with. And he says, the, the metaphor he uses is a, an old style bicycle. And he says that we have two very different sized wheels on that old style bicycle that what has happened in the, de in, in the development of NAEP and in, in the development of the measurement community is that we've, be we've become increasingly sophisticated and thoughtful about ever more precise measurement, te uh, me measurement uh, uh, techniques while our understanding of the sampling and the nature of the domains to be assessed has remained stuck in amber. And I, I think it's interesting in th when we think about assessment, we, we are assessing the subject matters that we teach in school 
and it's the, the, the comments that all of you are making are extremely interesting, but it's also interesting that I believe that you are all psychologists or measurement specialists. And I wonder what has happened to, and, and what your thoughts would be about Stake's critique in 2007, that our understanding of domains in themselves has been both a theor had been at a theoretical and conceptual stasis, and has not developed in any way at the with the kind of rapidity and precision of our increasingly dazzling measurement techniques. I'll just give you a really short answer, which is I refuse to teach assessment uh, to teacher ed candidates generically. Um, I will partner with my literacy and my math ed colleagues. Um, I think that um, they are not behind on this, though the measurement community is. Um, and I think that what I'm assuming that kind of sh major shift and by the way, if you really have a sociocultural perspective, you don't think we should have a separate measure of affect. You have some ideas about identity producing experiences and opportunities for kids to engage in practices. And those are all so blended that um, how you would con understand the content mm -hmm. is gonna be fundamentally different um, yeah. also. Yeah, I wouldn't quite agree with that, at least in the work we've done on five continents, rather than go in with a set of domains, which would be a so-called etic approach, uh, we spend a lot of time having anthropologists on our team interview teachers and students and parents in order to understand what they see as the domains, uh, and then we try to work with the domains as they define them. Also, Lori, I don't think our disagreement is as great as you say, because that is exactly what dynamic assessment is. Mm -hmm. And in 2002, I wrote a whole book with Liliana Grigorenko on dynamic assessment and argued uh, that that really should be the future of testing uh, based on Vygotsky's known of zone of proximal development rather than the kind of static testing we do. So I don't really think we have any big disagreement. We could, we could tackle this one for a while, but I want to give John Easton the last question. Uh, uh, thanks, Jim. I'm, I am John Easton from the Spencer Foundation. And I've enjoyed this panel very much. Uh, but I've also observed that many of the points that you, uh, have been brought up today, we've been hearing from you and your colleagues for 8, 10, 12 years. <laughs> These are about the misuse of test scores, the need to broaden our conception of what kids should be learning in schools. Uh, we've heard a lot for a long time about the value uh, and use of formative testing. Now, all of you are influential scholars. You have graduate students. You have colleagues in teacher education. So my question is, we've, we've known these issues. We've talked about them for a long time. But nobody pays any attention to us. Uh, why do we have so little influence, so little ability to communicate with those practitioners and policymakers that we all agree are so important? That's the most depressing point of the e of the day. <laughs> uh, well, to, to state the obvious, we have better theories of action for how we think testing ought to work than we have theories of action for how to change the existing system. We, it, we've got a lot of players, a lot of moving parts, a lot of vested interests, uh, powerful lobbies, um, well-intentioned legislators who know how to do things that they've seen done before, and uh, we don't have a good idea about how to get from here to there. Anybody want the last word on that one, and then we will call the panel to a close. I don't want the last word, but when I was an undergraduate, my advisor, who was an extremely distinguished psychologist, Endel Talving, said to me, what you don't realize at the age of 20 is that change is much slower to achieve than you think it is. Uh, and as I've gotten older, I think he's right. Uh, I've sometimes said to my friends that at the age of 65, I'm actually glad I have four-year-old triplets uh, because I won't be able to retire for a really long time. And if it weren't for them, I might just give up in despair uh, because we've had so little effect on practice. Uh, but now it's refreshing to know that I have either 20 years or until they pop off, until I pop off, uh, <laughs> or until their college is paid. But uh, I think we're all going to keep trying.
And, and I would remind folks that we have a panel right after this, which is about the translation of research to policy and vice versa. So would you join me in thanking the members of the panel? Because it's like we know.